Okay, so I really wanted to do a video today um, because it's raining and it's like thunder and I just, I really like thunder. I think it's a good soundtrack. And also because my face is painted. And I'm really excited that my face is painted. It's for camp today. And uh, it was all of a Celtic theme. So I did Celtic face paint on myself and little kids and other counselors. It was a lot of fun. And I also came home today and found out that they found a new Robert. The they found two new Robert the Bruce artifacts, which is freaking amazing because I love Robert the Bruce. And he's my paper, and so I have now two more sources to use, which is awesome. But anyway, back to the situation at hand, which is the Hobbit. So we are on chapter five. Chapter 5 is going to be in two parts, it's about 20 pages long, and I'm only trying to make each um, video uh, 20 minutes, which is about 10 pages each, which means it's going to take us about 36 videos, um, since it's 365 pages. So, here goes. It's called Riddles in the Dark. <clears throat> and the last time we were in the story, oops, sorry, the last time we were in the story, it was the dwarves had taken refuge in a cave, and the cave floor and the cave back um, disappeared, and they were abducted by goblins. And so the dwarves and Bilbo were about to be tortured by this head goblin when Gandalf came and rescued them and killed a bunch of the goblins, this, that, and the other. And then Bilbo fell and hit his head on a rock and everything went black. So this is where we pick up with Riddles in the Dark, chapter five. <clears throat> when Bilbo opened his eyes, he wondered if he had for it was just as dark as with them shut. No one was anywhere near him. Just imagine his fright. He could hear nothing, see nothing, and he could feel nothing except the stone of the floor. Very slowly he got up and groped about on all fours till he touched the wall of the tunnel, but neither up nor down it could he find anything. Nothing at all. No sign of goblins, no sign of dwarves. His head was swimming, and he was far from certain even of the direction they had been going and when he had his fall. He guessed as well as he could and crawled along for a good way till suddenly his hand met what felt like a tiny ring of cold metal lying on the floor of the tunnel. It was a turning point in his career, but he did not know it. He put the ring in his pocket almost without thinking. Certainly it did not seem of any particular use at the moment. He did not go much further, <laughs> but sat down on the cold floor and gave himself up to complete miserableness for a long while. He thought of himself frying bacon and eggs in his own kitchen at home, for he could feel inside that it was high time for some meal or other, but that only made him miserabler. He could not think what to do, nor could he think what had happened, or why he had been left behind or why, if he had been left behind, the goblins had not caught him, or even why his head was so sore. The truth was he had been lying quiet, out of sight, and out of mind, in a very dark corner for a long while. After some time, he felt for his pipe. It was not broken, and that was something. Then he felt for his pouch, and there was some tobacco in it, and that was something more. Then he felt for matches, and he could not find any at all, and that shattered his hopes completely. Just as well for him, as he agreed when he came to his senses. Goodness knows what the striking of matches and the smell of tobacco would have brought on him out of the dark holes in that miserable place. Still at the moment, he felt very crushed. But in slapping all his pockets and feeling all around himself for matches, his hand came out on the hilt of his little sword. 
the little dagger that he had got from the trolls, and that he had quite forgotten. Nor, fortunately, had the goblins noticed it, as he wore it inside his breeches. Now he drew it out. It shone pale and dim before his eyes. So it is an elfish blade, too, he thought. And goblins are not very near, and yet not far enough. But somehow he was comforted. It was rather splendid to be wearing a blade made in Gondolin for the goblin wars of which so many songs had been sung. And also he had noticed that such weapons made a great impression on goblins that came upon them suddenly. Go back, he thought. No good at all. Go sideways? Possible. Go forward. Only thing to do. On we go. So up he got and trotted along with his little sword held in front of him and one hand feeling the wall and his heart all of a pitter and a patter. Now certainly Bilbo was in what was called a tight place, but you must remember it was not quite so tight for him as it would have been for me or for you. Hobbits are not quite like ordinary people, and after all, if their holes are nice tree places and properly aired, quite different from the tunnels of goblins, still they are more used to tunneling than we are. They do not easily lose their sense of direction underground, not when their heads have recovered from being bumped. Also, they can move very quickly and hide easily and recover wonderfully from falls and bruises, and they have a, f a fund of wisdom and wise sayings that men have mostly never heard of or forgotten long ago. I should not have liked to have been Mr. Baggins in Mr. Baggins's place all the same. The tunnel seemed to have no end. All he knew was that it was still going down pretty, pretty steadily and keeping in the same direction in spite of a twist and a turn or two. There were passages leading off to one side every now and then, as he knew by the glimmer of his sword, where he could feel with his hand on the wall. Of these he took no notice, except to hurry past for fear of goblins or half-imagined dark things coming out of them. On and on he went, down and down, and still he heard no sound of anything except the occasional whirr of a bat by his ears, which startled him at first, till it became too frequent to bother about. I do not know how long he kept on like this, hating to go on, not daring to stop, on and on and his, until he was tireder than tired seemed like all the way to tomorrow and over it to the days beyond. Suddenly, without any warning, he trotted, splash, into water. Ugh, it was icy cold. That pulled him up sharp and short. He did not know whether it was just a pool in the path or the edge of an underground stream that crossed the, the passage or the brink of a deep, dark subterranean lake. The sword was hardly shining at all. He stopped, and he could hear, when he listened hard, drops drip dripping drip, from an unseen roof into the water below, but there seemed no other sort of sound. So it's a pool or a lake, and not an underground river, he thought. Still, he did not dare to wade into the darkness. He could not swim, and he thought, too, of nasty, slimy things with big, bulging, blind eyes, wriggling in the water. There are strange things living in pools and lakes in the hearts of the mountains. Fish whose fathers swam in goodness only knows how many years ago and never swam out again, while their eyes grew bigger and bigger and bigger from trying to see in the darkness. Also, there are other things more slimy than fish. Even in the tunnels and caves the goblins have made for themselves, there are other things living unbeknown to them that have sneaked in from outside to lie up in the dark. Some of these caves, too, go back in their beginnings to ages before the goblins, which only widened them and joined them up with passages, and the original owners are still there in odd corners, slinking and nosing about. Deep down here by the dark water lived old Gollum, a small, slimy creature don't know where he came from, or who or what he was. He was Gollum, as dark as darkness, except for two big, round, pale eyes in his thin face. He had a little boat, and he rode about,
quite quietly on the lake, for lake it was, deep and wide and deadly cold. He paddled it with large feet dangling over the side, but never did a ripple did he make. Not he. He was looking out. His pale, lamp-like eyes for blind fish, which he grabbed with his long fingers as quick as thinking. He liked meat, too. Goblin, he thought, was good when he could get it. But he took care they never found him. He just throttled them from behind if they ever came down alone anywhere near the edge of the water while he was prowling about. They very seldom did, for they had a feeling that something unpleasant was lurking down there, down at the very roots of the mountain. They had come on the lake when they were tunneling down, when they were tunneling down long ago, and they found they could go no further, so there their road ended in that direction. There was no reason to go that way unless the great goblin sent them. Sometimes he took a fancy for fish from the lake, and sometimes neither goblin nor fish came back. Actually, Gollum lived on a slimy island of rock in the middle of the lake. He was watching Bilbo now from the distance with his pale eyes like telescopes. Bilbo could not see him, but he was wondering a lot about Bilbo, for he could see that he was no goblin at all. Gollum got into his boat and shot off from the island while Bilbo was sitting on the brink, altogether flummoxed and at the end of his way and his wits. Suddenly, up came Gollum and whispered and hissed, Bless us and splash us, my precious. I guess it's a choice feast. At least a tasty morsel would make us Gollum. And when he said Gollum, he made a horrible swallowing noise in his throat. That is how he got his name, though he, al though he always called himself my precious. The hobbit jumped nearly out of his skin when the hiss came in his ears, and he suddenly saw the pale eyes sticking out at him. Who are you? He said, thrusting his dagger in front of him. What is he, my precious? whispered Gollum, who always spoke to himself, through never having anyone else to speak to. This is what he had come to find out, for he was not really very hungry at the moment, only curious. Otherwise, he would have grabbed first and whispered afterwards. I am Mr. Bilbo Baggins. I have lost the dwarves, and I have lost the wizard, and I don't know where I am, and I don't want to know. If only I can get away. What's he got in his hands is, said Gollum, looking at the sword which he did not quite like. A sword. A blade which came out of Gondolin. said Gollum, and became quite polite. Perhaps he sits here and chats with it a bit, seem my precious. It likes riddles. Perhaps it does, does it? He was anxious to appear friendly at any rate for the moment, and until he found out more about the sword and the hobbit, whether he was quite alone, really, whether he was good to eat, and whether Gollum was really hungry. Riddles were all he could think of. Asking them, sometimes guessing them, had been the only game he had ever played with other funny creatures sitting in their holes in the long, long ago before he lost all his friends and was driven away alone and crept down, down into the dark under the mountain. Very well, said Bobo, who was anxious to agree until he found out more about the creature whether he was quite alone, whether he was fierce or hungry, and whether he was a friend of the goblins. All right. You ask first, he said, because he had not had time to think of a riddle. So Gollum hissed, What has roots as nobody sees? Is taller than the trees? Up, up it goes, and yet never grows. Easy, said Bobo. Mountain, I suppose. Does it guess easy? Must have a competition with us, my precious. If precious asks and it doesn't answer, we eats it, my precious. If it asks us and we doesn't answer, then we does what it wants, eh? We shows it the way out, yes. All right, said Bobo, not daring to disagree and nearly burst, 
interrupting him, his brain to think of riddles that he could that could save him from being eaten. Thirty white horses on a red hill. First they chant, then they stamp, then they stand still. That was all he could think of to ask. The idea of eating was rather on his mind. It was a rather old one too, and Gollum knew the answer as well as you do. Chestnuts, chestnuts, he hissed. Teeth, teeth, my precious. But we has only six. Then he asked his second. Voiceless, it cries. Wingless, flutters. Toothless, bites. Mouthless, mutters. Half a moment, cried Bilbo, who was still thinking uncomfortably about eating. Fortunately, he had once heard something rather like this before, and getting his wits back, he thought of the answer. Wind. Wind, of course, he said. And he was so pleased that he made up one on the spot. This'll puzzle the nasty little underground creature, he thought. An eye in a blue face saw an eye in a green face. That eye is like to this eye, said the first eye, but in low place, not in high place. said Gollum. He had been underground a long, long time, and he was forgetting this sort of thing. But just as Bilbo was beginning to hope that the wretch would not be able to answer, Gollum brought up memories of ages and ages before, when he lived with his grandmother in a hole in a bank by a river. S my precious, he said. Sun on the daisies, it means it does. But these ordinary above-ground everyday sort of riddles were tiring for him. Also, they reminded him of days when he had been less lonely and sneaky and nasty, and that put him out of temper. What is more, they made him hungry. So this time he tried something a bit more difficult and more unpleasant. It cannot be seen, cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills and empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life kills laughter. Unfortunately for Gollum, Bilbo had heard that sort of thing before, and the answer was all around him anyway. Dark, he said, without even scratching his head or putting on his thinking cap. Box without hinges, key or lid, yet golden treasure inside is hid. He asked to gain time until he could think of a really hard one. This, he thought, a dreadfully easy chestnut though he had not asked it in the usual words. But it proved a nasty poser for Gollum. He hissed to himself. Still, he did not answer. He whispered and spluttered. After some while, Bilbo became impatient. Well, what is it? He said. The answer's not a kettle boiling over, as you seem to think from the noise you're making. It gives a chance. Let it give us a chance, my precious. Well, said Bilbo after giving him a long chance. What about your guess? But suddenly Gollum remembered thieving from nests long ago and sitting under the river bank, teaching his grandmother, teaching his grandmothers to suck. Eggsies, he hissed. Eggsies it is. Then he asked, alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsty, ever drinking, all in mail, never clinking. He also, in his turn, thought this was a dreadfully easy one, because he was always thinking of the answer. But he could not remember anything better at the moment. He was so flustered by the egg question. All the same, it was a poser for poor old Bilbo, who never had anything to do with the water if he could help it. I imagine you know the answer, of course, or can guess it, as easy as winking since you are sitting comfortably at home and not ha and have not the danger of being eaten to disturb your thinking. Bilbo sat and cleared his throat once or twice, but no answer came. That's where we'll stop for now. So, next video I'll try to do really quickly. Maybe tomorrow we'll find out. So yeah, that was the first half of Chapter 5 of The Hobbit called Riddles in the Dark. So, see you guys next time.